Hey tea heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. I'm releasing this video on Chinese New Year, so if you are watching at the time of posting, then happy Year of the Rabbit to each and all of you. Uh, as is tradition, every Chinese New Year, I like to present thoughts outside of tea and share ideas which have interested me recently. And today, I would like to discuss the fascinating subject of your attention and how fundamentally important it is for your happiness, health, and productivity. Attention was the subject of our recent game, the Attention Treasury last year, a game which started forming at the beginning of last year in my head. It began with my own personal exploration into how I could live a more productive and happier life. And just like many people, the start of the year is uh, an opportunity to review life, find those bottlenecks or stress areas and try to make improvements. And uh, I'm running several businesses and have a family and that makes juggling time a little bit difficult. You know, the to-do list of life always seems to be growing faster than you can tick things off. And I felt that my day-to-day -day life was a continuous race against the clock, which was leaving me exhausted and stressed. You know, how could I feel productive and fulfilled in all areas of my life whilst staying calm and happy? And this brought about my exploration into the fascinating and deceptively deep subject of attention. You see, we can talk about time management, uh, Pomodoro timers, calendar blocking, about how to formulate to-do lists and use automation or other methods to fit all of life's activities into your day. But I felt that these were all missing the essential point. They were all like a technical layer sitting on top of and trying to direct the fundamental resource of our attention. And so I felt that I needed to understand attention in more detail before trying to employ any new time management tools to my life, which I've tried a lot and they never worked. And, um, and in so doing, I found a beautiful clarity to these issues, which, I, which has subtly but powerfully changed the way that I live my life. And I want to share these changes with you, but I'll get on to that a little bit later. Before that, I wanna start by really understanding the primacy of attention. Attention is the ultimate human currency. What we choose to place our attention on is the first and most important decision that we can make. It is the primal act of free will and determines our present and our future. Individually and collectively, our attention choices determine the path of future generations. And of course, this assumes that you believe in the existence of free will, but that's the subject of an entirely different conversation, maybe for another time. Your entire human experience is the result of how you apply your attention to the world. It dictates the quality of your mental, emotional, and physical states and forges your path through life. As Epictetus, the Greek Stoic said, you become what you give your attention to. And this also applies to your attention to other people. Whenever we watch another person uh, performing an activity, we actually perform that act activity in our brains through the firing of mirror neurons. These neurons uh, found in various parts of the brain allow us to mirror the activities of others as though we were actually doing them ourselves. It's pretty remarkable. Um, although this is a relatively new area of research which began in the 1980s, scientists speculate that the purpose of mirror neurons may be to assist us with learning, mimicry, empathy, self-awareness, and the understanding of other people's intentions. It certainly further blurs the divide between me and you and highlights the influence that paying attention to others has on your own life. Another quote which always rings in my head about attention is from the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. I hope I'm pronouncing the name adequately. 
And his quote is, the most precious gift that we can offer anyone is our attention. When mindfulness embraces those we love, they will bloom like flowers. I love that quote. Paying focused and present attention to another person is the greatest gift that we can give. It nourishes others and in turn nourishes ourselves. Mindful attention is essential, in my opinion, for strong, empathetic, happy and supportive relationships and helps us all to learn from one another. Attention is therefore the bedrock of forming positive communities and a flourishing future for humanity. The problem is, of course, that we only have a limited amount of attention to give. In researching attention, I was gobsmacked by the limitations of our attention and it became a life-changing revelation which has shifted the way that I act during my day. Get ready for this, because this blew my mind. According to the calculations of renowned psychologist Mihai Csikszent Mihai and further verified by an engineer called Robert Lucky, our brains can process approximately a maximum of 126 bits of information per second. So this is the bandwidth of our conscious attention, which includes everything from processing the external stimuli of our environment, such as touch, taste, smell, sound, or visual inputs, to our internal reactions in the form of analysis, thoughts, or deductions. So no wonder closing your eyes and reducing attention to the outside world can help to focus your attention on taste or on music. And to put this 126 bits figure into context, it is thought that we need about 60 bits per second simply to understand one person speaking. So once you add all of the other background information that you may be consciously aware of, such as colors and shapes or smells and touch of the outside world, plus you include some internal processing like thoughts or working out how to reply to the person that you are speaking to, it is clear that you use up the majority of your entire bandwidth of attention just by having an in-depth conversation with another person. So like understanding two people speaking at the same time sort of approaches overload in your brain and you are likely to feel overwhelmed as you hit your attention bandwidth. Now, when I found this out, it really blew my mind. For some reason, I thought we had more attention or almost limitless attention. Appreciating the definite limits of our conscious attention made it feel so much more precious to me. And I ran the numbers and calculated that over an average lifetime, we might be able to process around 185 gigabits of information over our entire lifetime. And this is the digital equivalent of the amount of information stored in one 4K feature length movie. Now, while of course, digital information is not identical to the data processed by our brains, and I'm not clever enough to be able to do a exact conversion, I think that the figures are in some way comparable and at least offer a stark representation with, that we could fit all of the information that we can process consciously over a lifetime into, a, into the digital equivalent of a single movie was incredibly sobering for me. It made me feel that every single bit of attention that I give in my life is precious and should, should not be squandered or splintered. And this was the birth of the Attention Treasury game last year, the sudden appreciation of the treasure of our limited attention and how best to invest it for the fulfillment of our lives and the lives of our loved ones and future generations. Attention is not just the fundamental human resource which determines the quality and direction of our lives, but it is also radically limited by our biology, making it so, so very precious. <clears throat> Drinking an unreleased as yet tea, if you're interested. Thankfully, 
Our brains have developed ways to preserve attention so that it is not used up easily. Millions of neurons are constantly working in the background to monitor the environment subconsciously in order to select the important bits of information for us to pay attention to. Usually, they are monitoring the outside world for dangers or for opportunities, and they will command or direct your conscious attention when they think it is necessary. And this frees up our conscious attention bandwidth to allow us to apply our attention to other areas that we can choose. This process is called our attentional filter. And our attentional filter has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years. It's like um, our attention security team, which allows us to apply conscious attention to a task of our choosing, while it constantly surveys the environment for potential risks or opportunities, which it will then direct our conscious attention to when it feels that it is necessary. The attentional filter is the reason why you can, for example, drive for hours having a conversation with another person or listening to the radio and arrive without really remembering the scenery or journey. It filters out all of the perceptual information that it does not deem necessary for your conscious attention so that you can focus your attention on your area of choosing. But if like a deer is spotted running in your periphery or you hear the screeching sound of brakes of another car, your attentional filters will kick in and they will command you to focus your, att uh, your conscious attention to this stimuli immediately. Attentional filters allow us to focus our attention, uh, for example, on a crowded, in a crowded room on one conversation, and that's known as the cocktail party effect. Um, all the time knowing that our attention could and would be commanded if we heard like an emotive word or a sound in a different conversation, or for example, if an incredibly attractive person walked into the room. Our intentional filters are an incredible achievement of evolution. They were designed to allow us to complete tasks efficiently and pursue opportunity without being distracted by irrelevant things while all the time looking out for predators or better opportunities. But they were never designed for the amount of sensory input that we have to filter in the modern world and they can easily be hijacked. More on that later. First, let's continue to explore attention and the different types of attention. There are broadly two main types of attention, active and passive. Active or voluntary attention is self-directed, involving a conscious choice and is often goal-oriented. Active attention is the type of attention that we use when we work or play or socialize. It is often productive and participatory and involves mental activity and some effort and willpower. Passive or involuntary attention is usually attention directed by your attention filters. A loud noise or a strong aroma which represents danger, curiosity or arousal will command your attention. This type of attention is not self-directed and involves no willpower or decision making. Passive attention is usually much shorter lived, commanding a very short attention span. So once you've established the cause of that loud noise or strong aroma, then you can choose to focus your attention elsewhere. It's a very quick sort of on off mechanism. Oftentimes passive attention can evolve into active attention. For example, you might smell burning and that activates your attentional filters that draws your attention to that smell and that leads you to the kitchen to focus your attention on saving a meal that's burning. Or you may hear the sounds of footsteps outside late at night which focus your active attention to go and check the locks of your doors. But crucially, passive attention will always take priority over active attention. That's really important to remember. You may be in deep concentration working on a task, but when a teacher claps their hands loudly, then the whole class will always immediately look up. It always commands your attention. 
It's also important to say that the line between passive and active attention is not really clear, at least in my understanding. So we can say that passive attention is externally directed as opposed to internally directed active attention. But what about, for example, watching a movie or staring at a sunset? The subject of your attention is directed by external stimuli. However, the attention is also voluntary. It's a voluntary choice and may involve thought and analysis. Now, I have pondered over this at great length, like at great length <laughs> for many, 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 many days and hours about this sort of spectrum of attention types. And I've come to the conclusion that instead of just referring to these conventional categories of attention of passive versus active, I think it is more useful to split the components of attention across two parameters which can be mapped on a graph. Yes, graph is incoming. On one axis, we can decide if the attention is externally directed or internally directed. Now, this is pretty clear. At one end of the spectrum, we pay attention to aspects of our external environment, and on the other, our attention is drawn inwards to thought, planning, and ideas. Of course, this is a spectrum, and in most cases, the attention on external sources bring about internal attention, such as thought and analysis about that external stimuli. The other axis is a little bit more complicated. It moves from involuntary to voluntary. Now, in biology, these different types of responses are considered binary. They're either involuntary, meaning that they're out of your conscious control, such as your pupils dilating in the dark or your skin sweating when it is hot, or they're voluntary responses, such as reaching out to take your cup of tea or any act of free will. However, rather than thinking of them as black and white and binary, in the case of attention, I would like you to imagine that the axis of involuntary to voluntary is also a spectrum. On one hand, you have attention which is directed by your subconscious attentional filters, such as turning your head when you hear a knock at the door. And on the other, you have attention which is solely and completely under your control, uncommanded by anything but yourself. Now, if you think of the y-axis as defining the sources of your attention, then think of the x-axis as representing the amount of conscious and free control that you have over that attention. So you could use words like commanded versus self-determined, or constrained versus liberated. It gets a little bit fuzzy, but I think that in between you have attention that you have varying amounts of self-control over. I realize that this may seem a little hard to get your head around, and I too have puzzled over creating this chart myself. There's been many iterations of it. So let's just try to plug in some examples to see if we can make things a bit clearer. So down at the bottom left, you have attention which is involuntary and externally directed. This one's easy. Any attention which is commanded by an external source, such as, as we said before, a loud knock on the door. That will always make us turn our head. If we stay with sources that are externally directed, but move across the spectrum of control, then next up, we have to think of forms of attention which are hardly self-determined, but instead are determined by another person for the most part. An example I would put here would be watching Instagram Reels or TikToks, an endless stream of short-lived stimuli where the algorithm decides the content for our attention, and the only self-determination we have is really to flick and flick and flick to the next one. Next along, the spectrum are externally directed attention upon which we have a fair amount of control, maybe like watching a film or documentary which you have chosen because of a recommendation by another person or because you watched a trailer and you thought this might be an interesting film or documentary for me to watch. And finally, there are external sources of attention which are very much self-determined and liberated. And the perfect example is staring out into nature and simply observing nature. 
You can entirely choose what you are focusing your attention on, zoom in and out, and, uh, uh, and, and just consider all the different aspects that's in front of you and choose what you're focusing your attention on, even though it is all external. Right, let's jump up to acts of attention which are both externally directed and internally directed. An example of an involuntary attention of this type might be, for example, reading a pop-up notification on your computer and then considering your actions. One step across, and this might become uh, reading your work emails. While it is more self-determined, of course, it is still constrained and commanded by the acts of another person and your job. Moving along to more liberated acts of attention, perhaps taking photographs would work here as you react to the outside world but are liberated to frame and craft your picture personally. And finally, let's think of acts of truly liberated attention which are both externally inter and internally directed. I personally would choose to put cooking in this slot because I find the attention of cooking to be fully self-determined, especially if I'm not following a recipe, and involves reacting to external stimuli while also processing and planning and imagining the final dish. Finally, let's jump up and move along the line for internally directed sources of attention. Examples of constrained or commanded attention from internal sources might be obsessive thoughts. Next along may be the attention required for planning the next day's to-do lists. We could make that planning a bit more self-determined if it is more like big picture blue sky planning for the future. And finally, we could fully liberate the attention through activities such as philosophizing about life or writing a book or painting. Now, of course, we are all individuals and you may want to put your own examples in these slots. You may, for example, hate the act of cooking and would never consider it a form of liberated attention. You might engage more thought when watching a documentary and so it, it might rise higher up the y-axis to be more internally directed. Look, everyone will have their own interpretations of this chart. It's also important for me to say very clearly that I do not think that this chart is perfect and very much open to critique. And I present it simply as a working template for further improvement. But I do think that it allows us to visualize attention in a useful way. So let's look at the general themes in this chart rather than get bogged down in the details. First, let's look at the left-right spectrum. Attention towards the right has to be longer and more sustained. Attention towards the left is always shorter and more erratic. Involuntary attention will always take higher priority, as we said before. It will always supersede your voluntary attention for good reason. We need to react to dangers or immediate prospects as dictated by our attentional filters, and we need to react to them immediately, or we risk harm or a failure to benefit from an opportunity. But this means that attention to the left is more distracting and controlling. Attention to the right is instinctively lower priority because our instincts are always towards survival and procreation. And therefore, it is more fragile and harder to maintain, but more liberating. Attention paid on the left of the chart is unproductive. And because it requires shorter attention, it will deplete your attention span over time. Conversely, spending attention in areas to the right will be more productive and restore and lengthen your attention span. If we focus on the y-axis, then attention towards the top, so going higher, is more active, requiring more effort uh, than attention paid on areas at the bottom of the chart, which are more passive and require little to no conscious effort. The attention towards the top could be considered more goal-oriented. As we move down the chart, however, the attention is more autotelic, which means that it has its own self-purpose and is not necessarily trying to achieve any further goals. So if we put all of this together, we could say that moving more of our attention upwards and to the right will lead to ambitious, enthusiastic, expansive, 
proactive and more independent activities. Whereas placing our attention mostly in the opposite direction will lead to laziness and apathy as life becomes reductive and reactive and dependent on more involuntary and external control. Moving down and to the right leads to a calm and loose state. And even though more of your attention may be externally directed, the liberated uh, quality of it and the self-determined nature of that attention means that you remain sovereign of your own attention. Whereas moving in the opposite direction is generally going to make you more tense and stiff in nature and more submissive with your attention. Look, as I said, I'm sure that plenty of you can pick holes in this chart and in my interpretations, but I think that it generally provides a useful visual visualization to practically apply to our attention. And before we leave this chart, let's talk about one last aspect of attention that is fundamentally important. It's focus. How singular is your attention? We live in a society where multitasking is seen as an accomplishment. And I used to view my ability to juggle many things in my life in this way too. So perhaps I'm filling out a form while listening to a podcast and I'm sporadically reacting to email notifications and keeping a running tab of you know, my to-do list for the day or things to do tomorrow. I used to think that I was being very productive and maximizing my time um, in this way. But I now realize that I just wasn't using my limited and treasured attention efficiently. It was wasteful, unproductive, stressful, anxious, and exhausting. Of course, there are some instances where multitasking is necessary to complete a single task. So like calculating the cost price of an item in order to reply to an email, for example, or chopping up your vegetables while keeping an eye on the pasta, which is cooking. You know, these are limited to a singular activity. What I'm talking about is the very common act of splitting attention across multiple tasks, like replying uh, to a text message whilst um, having a conversation with another person. Living in a constant state of partial attention is one of the biggest problems of modern society. It makes us feel like we are being sort of multi multitasking winners when in fact we are becoming low productivity slaves to the notifications. Studies have shown that becoming distracted from any single task will usually mean that it takes around 20 minutes to regain full attention to that original task and that you're much more likely to become uh, distracted or allow yourself to become distracted again. It is not just an inefficient and wasteful use of the precious resource of your attention, it is also stressful and exhausting. Once again, the more stresses we feel, the more distractible we become, and so the vicious circle uh, is created. Distraction causes stress and anxiety, which leads to a susceptibility to more distraction. Also, very importantly, multitasking is self-selecting. What I mean by that is that, well, remember that attention to the left will always take priority and attention to the bottom will always require less effort. And so the tendency is that if we pursue a life of split attention, then we will inevitably prioritize the unproductive, reductive, reactive, and dependent activities over the productive, ambitious, and independent ones. One of the most commonly referenced traits of successful individuals is something called indistractability, the skill to focus attention on one activity at a time and to defend against all distractions. We can see that doing so leads to an efficient and treasured use of attention, as it should be. It will usually mean that the person is calmer, more level-headed, and more stimulated by their activities, meaning that they can work on them for longer, for more sustained periods. This type of attention is also self-selecting. It will also self-select activities which move towards productive, expansive, and independent outcomes. 
And let's not forget a very important point, which I'm not going to talk too much about in this, in this uh, video, but that stress and the stress caused from distracted living is the cause of a uh, driver of so many health issues facing our society from obesity to diabetes to heart conditions to name a handful. The term continuous partial attention was coined by Linda Stone, who was working for Microsoft, and she felt that it was mostly driven by FOMO, the fear of missing out on an opportunity or useful information if you uh, miss a phone call or don't check your emails. You see, we often see our needs to have our phones with us or staying connected to the internet as an addiction. But Addiction is a term used to describe the feeling of need for something which gives us pleasure. This is different from obsession, which is the feeling of need for something because of fear. The fear of missing out is a big driver for our need for connectivity and the anxiety that we get when our internet goes down or we leave home without our phones. But I would say that an even bigger or at least similarly uh, sized driver is FOFO, the fear of finding out. How many of you obsessively react to your phone with a sense of dread that that notification may be bad news? You have to check it just to calm that fear and you cannot function properly without allowing yourself to be distracted by that notification. Whatever the reason, addiction to the micro hit of dopamine that you get when you receive a nice comment on your social media post, or the dopamine that you get when you feel superior to another person through gossip about another person, or obsessive FOMO or FOFO, or the adrenaline hit that you may get from being outraged by another person's comment or the latest news. Whatever it may be, there is no doubt that our phones have become weapons of mass distraction, a weapon that is being deployed ruthlessly by the attention economy. So what is the attention economy? Perhaps you have heard the term already, but what does it actually mean? Surely, marketeers have always been vying for our precious attention. Well, yeah. As we said before, your attention has always been your primary commodity. And in order for someone to make money, they require your attention on what they have to sell. The advertising industry can be traced all the way back to ancient civilizations. The earliest advertising was sound-based or oral-based as most of the population was illiterate. Bamboo flutes used to attract attention to sell candy in China around 12,000 years ago. And that's evolved to the street criers of the Middle Ages, the town criers that would announce um, uh, public announcements, but then were used by companies to try to get your attention or at a marketplace, all the way up to the modern day jingles and sound notifications. Primitive written forms of advertising date back to Egyptians mar marking sales messages on papyrus and Indian rock paintings dating back to 4000 BC, which evolved to hoardings and street posters, all the way to pop-ups and display advertising on your computer screen or your phone. Ever since we left our hunter-gatherer roots and began trading, we have needed ways to direct attention to what we have to offer. This is nothing new. We've also learnt over time how to understand and manipulate human psychology in order to command attention. The use of outlandish and lurid messaging, which causes arousal or fear, are the best way to grab our attention. As we said before, these signals take priority and overcome our inbuilt attentional filters to command our attention. Now, if we refer back to that chart, attention grabbing through advertising or any other means is always best achieved through moving our attention towards the bottom left of the chart. Short and lurid stimuli causing an involuntary response by triggering primal reactions of fear or arousal will almost always distract us. It makes us passive and controllable. 
So what makes the modern day any different? The reason why we are said to be living in an attention economy is primarily because of the digital era. The digitization of information allows us to have an extraordinary abundance of all kinds of content at the fingertips of potentially every person on the planet with an internet connection. That information can grow almost limitlessly and means that we are all drowning in excessive information, which is all vying for our attention. It is predicted that by 2025, we will have about 175 zettabytes of digital information. Now remember that we can only consciously process around 185 gigabits of information in our entire lifetime. And that includes all of our thoughts and conversations and conscious experience of the world around us outside of digital information. That means that in order to consciously process all of the information that's digital, we would need to plug over 7.5 trillion humans into the internet and leave them processing that information from birth to death, just to cover the information which has been digitized without creating any more over that lifetime. They would not be able to communicate with each other or process any of the wealth of information from the outside world, which has inspired and engaged the entirety of human history for over 200,000 years before about the 1970s or 1980s. To put this into perspective, the, this number of people, 7.5 trillion people, is estimated to be about 65 times the number of humans to have ever existed. The amount of digital information out there is mind boggling and growing at an accelerated rate. And by comparison, the amount of attention that we have to pay to that information is tiny and limited. And with the human population starting to, decl to decline, the resource of attention is going to become even more scarce. An economy is dictated by its most scarce commodity. You can argue that attention has always been the primary commodity of all economies, and I think that's true. But with the departure from the gold standard of money and the astronomical gulf that's developed between the wealth of information out there and the poverty of attention that we have to give, we have made attention the primary economic driver and cemented our society in a frenzied battle for our attentions. And this has led to a new breed of companies who harvest and sell our attention, the attention merchants, which make up one of the richest industries in human history. So how have Google, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all the other attention merchants out there become so successful in such a short time? Of course, they could not exist without the internet and the immensely useful connectivity that it brings. Most of the world now depends on the internet to go about their daily work or play, to socialize or learn, to create or even to buy things. The internet has penetrated our whole waking and sleeping life. And for most of us, there is no way that we could function without it. It used to be that information was limited to posters slapped onto billboards in the hopes of attracting the attention of a few hundred or a few thousand passers-by in a single day on a single street corner. But with the digital age, you could reach the whole world 24 hours a day in the knowledge that everyone needs to stay online to function in their day-to-day. -day. We can never fully escape the scrutiny and manipulations of the attention merchants. We also live in a time of extraordinary technological sophistication, where our attention can be monitored by automated and self-learning algorithms easily. We can be tracked wherever we go so that the attention merchants know more about us than even our closest relatives and ourselves. They know where we go, what we eat, when we sleep, 
what arouses us or disgusts us. They know our fears and obsessions. They know what triggers us to spend money. They know our political leanings and all of our interests. They are armed with every bit of information possible, much more than we can possibly consciously know about ourselves in order to use it to command our attention at their whim. Another incredible feat achieved by the attention merchants is that most of their content upon which they can watch us feed and gather more information about us is created without any real costs. The highest revenue attention merchants have worked out and tapped into the innate human desire for communication and attention in order to generate content with no costs. The user creates the content and can create many thousands of times more content at their own expense than would be possible by the companies themselves. The prime work of the companies then becomes to simply devise attention algorithms targeted to each viewer to push the most attention grabbing content to the top of the feeds. They enforce strict community guidelines so that they can keep their advertising revenues protected and make sure that any content favors their own economic or potentially political interests. And then provide creators with tools and stats to see who is winning the most attention and advice and tips on how to improve those rankings. This competition between users leads to the development of clickbait, lurid and sensational content, shorter and more distracting stimuli and copycat content which follows formulas and trends rather than the celebration of unique ideas and uh, which are presented in a, in a considered and long form way or, or un unconventional approaches that have not been tried before. Uh, <laughs> And remarkably, those who do not have the inclination to create original content can still effortlessly and anonymously um, help the attention merchants by adding emotive comments in the comment section and engage in comment conversations and arguments to help the companies leverage extra attention from the same piece of original content. Given the primary requirement of grabbing people's attention is no surprise that the winning formula is to produce content which moves our attention down and to the left of that attention chart, promoting the most distracting, lurid, short and arousing content which validates the learned ideologies and interests of the viewer, which leads to more entrenched dogmatic and extreme points of view without any balance or counterpoint. Content quality largely then becomes a race to the bottom. Quick, easy and passively engaging. We just have to flick a screen endlessly to feed the algorithms more information about how to control us and grab more of our attention. Now, let me just pause for a moment from this diatribe to say that there is plenty of incredible content, content being made out there and that this subject is absolutely not black and white. I'm also very, very, very thankful to have access to platforms to discuss these ideas and my passion for tea <clears throat> with so many people out there. Social media and other attention merchants can be used and enjoyed in amazing ways and has transformed my life. I'm also not saying that the attention merchants are all sort of um, um, premeditated evil big tech who have no desire to improve our lives. I'm just sounding a warning that many others are also flagging, including people within the industry. This is an area which I grapple with myself as a creator. Do I just want to grab your attention and get your views and the likes and the exposure? Or do I want to be respectful of the treasured resource of your attention and try to give as much value as possible to your attention investment by leading you to the more positive areas of that attention chart? I think that all users and creators must be conscious of not diverting too much of our attention towards 
the bottom left of our chart. Unfortunately, it is inevitable that if attention is all that is sought, we will continue to move to short, instantly arousing and distracting content which titillates rather than enlightens. We can clearly see that this trend is happening on most platforms. And in my view, this leads to so many other issues downstream. It means that our attention will be wasted instead of being used for more positive, productive and restorative uses. It will lead to apathy, depression and excessive control by others rather than liberated, ambitious and expansive living. It will encourage entrenched ideologies and fighting rather than discourse, humility and unity. It will shorten our attention spans, making us less able to use our attention wisely and encourage addictions for short-lived micro doses of dopamine or obsessions from FOMO or FOFO. It will cause stress and anxiety as we find it hard to focus our attention on the simple majesty of the present moment or the tasks that will truly enrich our futures. It will lead to a world that is forever being triggered and reactive rather than calm, accepting and tolerant. And so this is what the attention treasury game was all about. Helping us to explore this most primary and special resource so that we can invest it wisely for positive returns. How do we do this? How can you spend your attention wisely? Well, we're all different. We will all have different ideas on how to invest our attention. But the most important thing to do, something which I have committed myself to do every day, is what is called meta-attention. Meta-attention simply means doing a bit of this, rising outside of your everyday life to pay attention to how you are using your attention. In many ways, you could say that meditating is a form of meta-attention as you step back and observe yourself to achieve a new clarity and a sense of awareness, pure awareness. But the meta-attention that I'm talking about here is more analytical. Consider that chart and do a little audit every day to see how or where you are paying your attention and make a commitment to try to move to the right side as much as you can. Now, whether or not your attention is up at the top of the y-axis or low, lower, so whether or not it's totally self-directed or totally externally directed or somewhere in between, is largely dependent on how much energy you have. But just be sure, in my opinion, that you allocate some attention to higher and lower attention states. All states to the right of the chart are positive in my view, with some being more ambitious and proactive and some being more calming and restorative. Of course, it is inevitable and essential that your attention will also be paid to other parts of the chart. But try to find ways to limit these to set times which are under your own control. So consider turning off as many notifications on your phone as possible. Consider using ad and tracking blockers to prevent excessive information being shared with the attention merchants. Consider making a commitment to use these platforms only when you want to search and learn about something rather than passively going to them to be spoon fed from their algorithm. And try searching for information that does not support your existing views. Have moments of complete non-connectivity where you turn off the phone and the computer and just perform activities without even the possibility of distraction. A tea session is a particularly wonderful daily ritual for this, of course. And most importantly, in my view, the one change which has transformed my stress levels and productivity and time management and happiness is to simply make sure that you focus on one thing at a time. 
This means that if you're brushing your teeth, then focus your attention on the feeling and thoroughness of brushing your teeth. If you are having a conversation with someone, then make sure that it is as singular as possible without distraction. If you are working on a project, then do not react to the email notifications or phone calls. Become indistractable. At first, I worried that this approach would make me less productive or slow me down, or that I would miss out on timely information, which would impact my life negatively. But I've learned from experience that the opposite is the case. 99% of distractions can wait. And if an idea or reminder pops into my head, then I just jot it down on a piece of paper to consider later and I immediately go back to my singular attention without any more thought to that distraction. Focused and sustained attention is the most productive and calm mode to be in and naturally moves your activities to the right side of that chart effortlessly. Sometimes it feels like I'm moving eerily slowly because I'm accustomed to juggling lots of things at the same time, but I remind myself of the expression passed down from sailors over generations who found that moving too fast through the water makes a ship wobbly, inefficient, and at risk of capsizing. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. I am amazed at how these single acts of meta-attention and focused singular attention have made to my life. I am calmer, I am more productive, and I am happier. And I would implore you to try to apply these techniques yourself. I hope that you found my explorations into attention interesting. And I would of course invite you all to share your thoughts and opinions in that comment section below. Thank you to everyone who took part in the Attention Treasury game. It is still online if you're watching at the time of release of this video. It's going to be online until the end of February 2023. So if you're interested in diving in, then go to attentiontreasury.art. That's it, T-Heads. I raise a cup and wish you all a very happy, healthy and attentive Chinese New Year. Cheers. Bye.